There are amendments at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <laughs> Rasmussen moves to amend House Bill number 2128, the third engrossment, as amended. The amendment is coded A27-1. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Rasmussen, who will explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a state, we have lots of mandates on businesses. All the mandates, fees, and other laws can come to a cost for businesses here in the state. The A27 amendment recognizes that fact. The amendment would ensure that if a generic drug manufacturer is being investigated for increasing their prices under the price gouging language included in the omnibus, they can include all of the costs imposed by the state in their cost reports. If our mandates as a state are causing the price of drugs to go up, we should be aware of that. I would ask for member support on this common sense amendment. Further discussion to the A27 amendment. Further discussion. Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a reasonable amendment. I uh, ask members for a yes vote. Further discussion to the author of the amendment, Representative Rasmussen. No further discussion. No further discussion. All those in favor of the A27 amendment say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Rasmussen moves to amend House Bill number 2128. The third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A25-1. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Rasmussen. Please explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I begin, I will request a roll call. Roll call having been requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. We know that generic drugs are significantly cheaper than their brand name competitors. According to the FDA, generics are usually 80 to 85% cheaper than brand name drugs. Generics have saved tens of billions of dollars each year. Just in Minnesota alone in 2019, Minnesotans saved four and a half billion dollars because of generic drugs. The HHS omnibus includes language that would have the state review price increases for generic drugs and allow the attorney general to go after manufacturers he believes increase their prices too much. Interestingly, it only allows him to review the prices of generic drugs, even though the top 20 most expensive drugs are all name brand, not generics. AARP's Public Policy Institute says that the average generic drug prices over a 24-month period in their last report is actually in deflation of just under 12%. Members, the price of generics is actually going down. In addition, 10% of drugs dispensed are brand name drugs, but they account for 78% of drug costs. Generics are 90% of drugs dispensed, yet only account for 22% of drug costs. Again, the language in the omnibus before the House does nothing to go after the cost of brand drugs, which is the problem. The A25 amendment recognizes the low cost of generics and the benefit that they offer to the cost of care here in Minnesota. I would clarify, it would clarify that if a generic is 50% cheaper than the brand name competitor, then that doesn't count as price gouging. Without this amendment, we discourage generics from entering the market in Minnesota, which would result in lower competition and higher prices for Minnesotans. Members, the bill as written would have the Attorney General go after generic drugs that are saving Minnesotans money. My amendment would exempt generic drugs that are at least one half of the cost of the brand name or cheaper. This will encourage more generics to compete in Minnesota, saving patients money. I would ask members for their support. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further discussion to the A25 amendment. 
The representative from Anoka, Representative Stevenson. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would ask members to vote no on this amendment. Just because something is a generic doesn't mean that there isn't price gouging going on. In fact, probably the most famous example of prescription drug price gouging happened on a generic Martin Screlly, the infamous Pharma Bro, and Daraprim, which he increased the price 5,000% overnight. That was a generic. I'd ask members to vote no. Further discussion? Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's important to point out that in committee, many of the examples that were brought to us about generics increasing in price are actually in the scope of a very competitive generic market. For example, the Attorney General brought up uh, the generic for Prozac increasing in price. But actually, if you look today, there's 38 uh, generic manufacturers of the drug. So if one increases their price, patients and their plans and providers can simply switch to another generic. I worry, Mr. Speaker and members, that this law, unless we take this amendment, that we will actually leave Minnesotans without access to generics, which have been key to driving down the cost of prescription drugs, not just here in Minnesota, but across the country. I would urge members to vote yes on the amendment to help keep prescription costs down. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Members, please vote. Let me just finish this last piece. Will the clerk call the names of those members who have not yet voted? Draskowski. Draskowski, aye. Draskowski, aye. Hanson, R. Hanson, R, no. Hanson, R, no. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Hertas. Hertas. McDonald. McDonald. McDonald, aye. McDonald, aye. Nash. Nash, aye. Nash I. Pinto. Pinto, no. Sundin. No. Sundin, no. Swazinski. Swazinski, I. Swazinski, I. The clerk will close the roll. There being 60 ayes and 71 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Quam moves to amend House Bill number 2128, the third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A39-1. To the author of the amendment, Representative Quam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And before I get distracted by uh, the hours of vigorous debate we'll have on this amendment. I wish to ask for a roll call. A roll call having been requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Kwan. Thank you. This is a fairly simple amendment. It's uh, deleting out the exception of SIGIP. Uh, and earlier we heard in debate, there's no equity. There's a problem with equity. Well, this, this amendment would provide equity in that it would not have the members in this chamber and other state employees exempted from language in the bill that affected the formularies, prevented adjustment through the year. If a uh, drug price goes up, you switch to a different one. Um, we really need to not treat ourselves differently and exempt us from what we're doing to the private plans. So this amendment is about equity and fair treatment. And I ask for your green vote. Discussion to the amendment. 
The representative from Olmsted, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Well, I would ask for a no vote on this. Sometimes there is a good and principled reason for treating our employee plan differently than other plans in the market. So members need to understand the part of the bill that is being amended here is a part that our Representative Elkins worked on quite a bit and something that um, actually a couple of years ago, Representative, former Representative Cantrell worked on, and that is trying to end the really egregious practice of health plans selling somebody a an insurance product, where the person, you know, people shop on Minsure or otherwise, they shop for their insurance product often in the individual market, and they, if they have a need for a certain drug that they take on a regular basis, they will often choose a plan based on the formulary that's within that plan. So what this bill does, what this provision in the bill does is say, you can't switch out in the middle of the plan year anymore, just willy nilly. This is something that the um, Minnesota Medical Association is very interested in because they know how bad this is. But one of the most egregious aspects of this practice by health plan companies is that the consumer buys something for a particular reason and is bound for the duration of that health plan. I think it's a, a year it would be ordinarily. And yet the company can pull away that benefit at any time and make that whole reason that the consumer bought that plan becomes moot. So in, in our public employees plan, which we all call CGIP, that's what we're talking about. CGIP is our public employee plan for Minnesota employees. We don't pick a formulary. We all have the same formulary. So this aspect of choosing a plan based on the formulary or, um, or just getting into the plan and taking the formulary that's there, it's very different. So that's why it makes a lot of sense to exempt CGIP from these provisions because this is not about the uh, consumer getting the benefit of their bargain. And that is what the underlying bill is about. So members, I would urge you to vote no on this amendment. Further discussion? The author of the amendment, Representative Kwong. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. And I'm a bit perplexed by the, the chair's discussion because this amendment is about equity. It's about treating us here the same as we're deciding to treat the rest of the state. And also treating the citizens of Minnesota the same as we deign to be treated. So I would hope that you would join me in voting green for this and saying that we are no different. We are Minnesotans here, part of our communities, and should be treated the same and such. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Members voting remotely, please vote. The clerk will call the names of all those who have not yet voted. Draskowski. Draskowski, aye. Draskowski, aye. Hanson, R. Hanson, R, no. Hanson, R, no. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Hertas. Hertas. <laughs> McDonald. McDonald, aye. McDonald, aye. Moran. Moran, no. Moran, no. Nash. Nash, aye. Nash, aye. Olson, L. No. Olson, L, no. Richardson. Richardson, no. Richardson, no. Sundin. No. Sundin, no. Swazinski. 
Sosinski, aye. Sosinski, aye. The clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Esperson moves to amend House Bill number 2128, the third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A28-1. To the author of the amendment, Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Before I begin, I will request a roll call. A roll call having been requested, Almost seeing 15 hands. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. As many of you know, uh, and as we just discussed in the last amendment, health plans have drug formularies, which is one of the limited tools that health plans have to help control prescription drug costs for their enrollees. Drug formularies set which drugs are preferred by a particular plan. Both public plans operated by DHS and private plans have drug formularies. If a drug manufacturer introduces a price spike on a drug, the health plan may remove it from the formulary and move an enrollee to a comparable drug to help manage costs. This ultimately keeps costs down for patients and employers providing health insurance to their employees. The HHS, the HHS omnibus before the House includes a requirement that private insurers only change their drug formularies once a year. This is called a frozen formulary. However, language in the omnibus allows public programs to update their drug coverage quarterly. This creates a significant misbalance between private and public insurance. The current omnibus language exempts public plans from this new health insurance mandate for good reasons. Fiscal notes show that imposing this mandate on public plans and CGIP would cost the state tens of millions of dollars. The cost of mandating an annual frozen formulary on CGIP, which only insures about 2% of Minnesotans, would cost the state about $16 million per year. $16 million per year for only 2% of Minnesotans. Imagine what the cost will be for the rest of Minnesotans with this new mandate. The A28 amendment fixes the misbalance proposed in the omnibus between private and public plans. The amendment would simply allow private insurers the same leeway that we give DHS in operating Minnesota care and medical assistance. Both private plans and public plans would be allowed to update their formulary quarterly, creating protections for patients while also helping plans manage costs. My amendment treats these plans the same and will avoid increasing the cost of insurance for families and small businesses who rely on the individual and group insurance market here in Minnesota. The Minnesota Chamber of Commerce has submitted a letter of support that has been circulated to members. The Chamber urges a yes vote on the amendment because they recognize the impact that this will have on the cost of health insurance for small employers and their employees. Madam Speaker and members, my amendment will provide more protections to patients while creating consistency between private and public plans. This is a good government, good faith amendment, and I would ask for members' support to keep insurance premiums and out-of-pocket costs down for Minnesotans. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Discussion to the amendment. The member from Hennepin, Representative Elkins. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so th there is a fundamental difference between a commercial plan with a plan year and public assistance plans like uh, Minnesota Care or medical assistance. With a commercial plan, the plans negotiate with manufacturers over the summer, lock in prices for the following year, uh, uh, with including price protection against the, the manufacturer's annual January price increases. Uh, and they make representations uh, to their prospective members during open enrollment about the coverage of their drugs over that plan year. And as Representative uh, uh, Chair Liebling stated on, with respect to the previous amendment, um, people count on the, the choices and the, uh, that they've made during open enrollment being honored throughout the year. With medical assistance, there is no plan concept of a plan year. People come on and off medical assistance all throughout the year. 
And so there is no annual formulary. The formulary continuously changes for medical assistance uh, and it's, it's never locked in. Uh, but then again, there has been you know, no, represent, no representation to the members or prospective members that it, that it will be locked in. The quarterly provision that uh, is in the bill does give those members of uh, um, participants in medical assistance some protection against arbitrary mid-year formulary changes. Uh, but to compare the commercial side to the medical assistance side uh, is, is apples and, and, and oranges. So I would urge members to vote no on this amendment. Further discussion, the member from Ottertail, Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you to Representative Elkins. I appreciate his work on this issue. I will have to disagree with my friend, uh, Representative Elkins, on a few points. One is that the idea of a plan year is different between public and private plans. And actually, a bill that Representative Elkins had introduced to this House had not only a frozen formulary, but actually required drug manufacturers to not increase their prices during that plan year. Unfortunately, the legislation before the House does not have that prohibition on drug manufacturers increasing their price. So without adopting this amendment, Madam Speaker, the House is putting Minnesotans at risk of big pharma coming in increasing drug prices and having those price increases passed on to employers and to people who are paying insurance premiums. The other point I would make is that we know that this is going to cost Minnesotans more in their insurance costs. We have heard a report in the Commerce Committee that this would increase costs by uh, $75 million over five years for Minnesotans. In addition, Representative Morrison uh, last session worked on prior authorization legislation that provides protections to enrollees on private plans if they have prior authorization that they cannot be changed off the formulary. This law just took effect in January, and so we have yet to see the impact that that will have on consumer issues with formulary changes. Members, Madam Speaker, I would request a yes vote on this amendment. A yes vote is for lower insurance premiums and helping keep the cost of health care down for Minnesotans and small businesses. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Sibley, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker and uh, members. Yeah, I'd rise in support of uh, Representative Rasmussen's amendment. I, you know, I've sold health insurance uh, since 1978. I can't believe it, but I have. <laughs> um, and for the most part, when there's changes in the formula, okay, with private insurance, it does, people are pretty well satisfied. But occasionally I have somebody come in the office and say that they were, their insurance plan switched them to a different, uh, you know, a less costly drug, and it doesn't work as well. And so I do think there should be some type of a provision that if they're going to switch people from a particular drug, that that person is notified ahead of time and has a chance to appeal. The problem with the, with the uh, language in the current bill, it's a one-size-fits-all, and it's going to drive up costs for, the, for uh, uh, Minnesota citizens on health insurance, which is already a burden for so many families. So I think that... Uh, there does need to be a caveat about this. I don't think the current language uh, uh, is the right direction to go. So I, I, I'd also say give Representative Morrison's uh, bill a chance to be implemented to see what the, what the results are. Uh, and we could address it in, uh, in the uh, next session. So I would urge a green vote for Representative Rasmussen's bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Further discussion to the amendment? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. All those voting remotely, please vote. The clerk will call the names of all those members who have not yet voted. Draskowski. Draskowski, aye. 
Doskowski, aye. Hamilton. Hamilton, no. Hamilton, no. Hanson, R. Hanson, R, no. Hanson, R, no. Hausman. Hausman, no. Hausman, no. McDonald. McDonald, aye. McDonald, aye. Moran. Moran, no. Moran, no. Nash. Nash, aye. Nash, aye. Sundin. No. Sundin, no. Swazinski. Swazinski, aye. Swazinski, aye. The clerk will close the roll. There being 60 ayes and 72 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Damoth moves to amend House Hall number 2128. The third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A22-1. To the author of the amendment, Representative Damoth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The A22 is about fairness. DHS moved all drug benefits to their preferred drug list in January or in July of 2019 as the first step towards carving out the entire drug benefit for the public programs. By doing so, DHS is wanting to operate as a pharmacy benefit manager. DHS, through its, the formulary committee, already does several of the tasks we defined as tasks of a PBM when we first regulated them in 2019. They make prior authorization determinations on prescription drugs. They contract with pharmacies to provide prescription drugs to enrollees. They receive and administer rebates for prescription drugs. Yet, DHS has been exempted from the PBM regulations. If DHS, through their formulary committee, wants to operate as a PBM, then they should be subject to the same requirements as PBMs. This is simply a matter of fairness. And with that, Madam Speaker, I would request a roll call. A roll call being requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Discussion to the amendment. The member from Olmsted, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Speaker and uh, members. Well, even if what uh, Representative Damon says is true, the amendment doesn't make a whole lot of sense, frankly. The amendment actually has not DHS, but the formulary committee um, being uh, becoming a PBM. The formulary committee doesn't make any of these decisions. The formulary committee is just an advisory committee. So um, it, it just doesn't make any sense, members, and I would just ask for a no vote. Discussion to the amendment. The author of the amendment, Representative Damon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We do know that uh, the Drug Formulary Committee does advise DHS on all of these decisions, similar to a PBM. So again, this is about fairness. A green vote would bring fairness to this process. I would encourage a green vote. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Members voting remotely, please vote. The clerk will call the names of all those members who have not yet voted. <clears throat> Draskowski. Draskowski, aye. Draskowski, aye. Hanson, R. Hanson, R, no. Hanson, R, no. Hausman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Her. Her, no. Kosnick. Kosnick, aye. 
Kosnick, aye. McDonald. McDonald, aye. McDonald, aye. Miller. Miller, aye. Moran. Moran, no. Moran, no. Nash. Nash, aye. Nash, aye. Nelson, N. Nelson, N, aye. Nelson, N, aye. Sundin. No. Sundin, no. Swazinski. Swazinski. Swazinski, aye. Swazinski, aye. The clerk will close the roll. There being 62 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Schumacher moves to amend House Bill number 2128, the third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A51-1. To the author of the amendment, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, the A51 amendment is an attempt to try and fix some of the choking off of valuable funds that are going and being taken away from our vulnerable hospitals throughout the state. Within the 340B program that is being uh, cut out from this bill, certain entities like children's hospitals, a AIDS drug assistance programs, and safety net providers that receive drugs at a significantly lower cost will no longer be able to receive that. Instead, the state is going to carve that out and deal with it on their own. Now, there is a bucket of money that is going to be put in to help support those that are cut, but only some of them that are cut and not to the levels that they're receiving now and not for the purposes that they're receiving now. And so members, I would ask for your support on this and the upcoming impending amendments. There's an amendment to the amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Schumacher moves to amend his amendment to House Bill number 2128, the third engrossment as amended. The amendment to the amendment is coded A85. To the author of the amendment, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. And uh, just as I had mentioned with some of the vulnerable hospitals that are going to be choked off from funding and the, the hospitals that are going to receive extra funding through another uh, fund throughout this bill, there are those that are going to be left on the cutting room floor. And this amendment clarifies that when we're talking about these 340B providers, we're talking about several tribal organizations. Uh, specifically, we include the Minneapolis Indian Health Board, the Mille Lacs Lake Band of Ojibwe Services, and the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, as they all rely on this fund as it is now that this bill tries to strip out. These health care providers will lose money if the language in this bill becomes law, and I would ask for a roll call, Madam Speaker. A roll call having been requested on the amendment to the amendment. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Schumacher. Please vote green, members. Discussion to the amendment to the amendment. The member from Olmsted, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Well, members, um, actually the entities listed in this amendment don't actually participate in the 340B program according to DHS. This kind of illustrates how complicated this whole thing is, but these entities are compensated differently. They don't participate in that program. So um, you can, you know, this is trying to make a political point. The amendment to the amendment makes a political point, I suppose, but it's a political point that's absolutely wrong. So I mean, members are free to vote yes. I guess I'll vote yes on it, but it really makes no difference to the underlying amendment, and it just um, it just uh, is is a mistake. So um, go ahead and vote yes, members. Discussion to the amendment to the amendment. Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. And it's it's interesting that uh, apparently these don't uh, matter in the 340B. Uh, funding piece here, yet they are required to uh, report in the bill that we have coming forward. So apparently they sometimes are important to this process and sometimes they aren't, depending on how the mood is of uh, the bills that we have 
coming forward and the votes we have coming forward. But since Chair Liebling had said that she uh, would vote yes on this and support the amendment, I will withdraw my request for a roll call. The request for a roll call has been withdrawn. Further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, aye. please say nay. The amendment to the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment to the amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Schumacher moves to amend his amendment to House Hall number 2128. The third engrossment as amended. The amendment to the amendment is coded A88. To the author of the amendment, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair and members, Madam Speaker and members. The A88 amendment, similar to the last one that we just adopted, also uh, highlights the fact that there are hospital systems that are receiving support now that will not be receiving support after this bill passes. And we are trying to address that. And so we listed out several hospitals within the amendment. We were not exhaustive in this list of amendments that needed to be addressed, but we will uh, continue with that. And I would ask for your support and Madam Chair I would ask for a roll call. Roll call having been requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Discussion to the amendment to the amendment. The member from Olmsted, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Well, this one um, also, I would just vote yes to put it on. Um, in the bill, we are, uh, this 340B program is something that we haven't really spoken a lot about in the legislature before this year, a little bit, but not very much. And this is um, a program that is essentially, it's a federal program. It was uh, discussed a little bit earlier today. And what is happening is there's what I would describe as a hidden subsidy going through our medical assistance program to a lot of entities um, that are, um, some of which are probably described in this amendment. What our bill does is it takes the entire pharmaceutical program under our public programs and takes it all away from the managed care organizations and their PBMs, because every one of them has a PBM that's taking who knows what chunk of, of the money. It takes all that back and puts it under DHS to be administered as one unit. In that process, some of these organizations do lose the hidden subsidy. And what we've got in the bill is a pot of money to keep them whole. Now, the problem that we have, we also have reporting in the bill for the very first time to have the entities report how much they're getting under the program and for DHS also to report what it can learn what for the um, um, on the other side of the transaction, because the reality is we really don't have very good information about how much these entities are getting under this program, but we do know that the dollars they're getting are coming through our medical assistance program and that we, the legislators who appropriate this money, don't know how much it is and where it's going. And so what this bill will do is end that, but it does have a pot of $14 million to, um, that's ongoing to make these organizations whole because we, although it's a hidden subsidy, we weren't aware they were getting it. Um, we, we, none of us want to destabilize important organizations that are helping to support low-income people in our state. So I would ask you, um, on this amendment, I, I think that I will just vote for it. It doesn't really matter if it goes on, but then I'm going to ask you to vote no on the underlying bill. Discussion to the amendment to the amendment. Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And with that glowing endorsement from Chair Liebling, I would uh, withdraw my request for a roll call on this amendment and ask people to vote green. Roll call has been withdrawn. All those in favor of the amendment to the amendment, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the amendment to the amendment is adopted. And we are on the underlying amendment. Discussion to the underlying amendment. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would uh, Representative Sandstead yield to a question? I will yield. She will yield. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Sandstead, uh, Fairview Range is inhibiting, uh, and I've uh, had the occasion of visiting with a number of hospitals around the state, uh, no exception with the folks at Fairview Range. 
Um, you've gone through some very difficult times uh, up there on the range, particularly with health care and trying to make sure that uh, budgets are balanced. And I'm just wondering if you have discussed with the management and leadership of that hospital how uh, the effects of removing the 340B uh, provision uh, would have on their balance sheet. Representative Sandstead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Albright, Fairview Range has just recently gone um, under new management. Uh, the director recently left. And I'm not sure if the person in charge right now is in a temp position or a permanent position, but I have not heard from any of the hospital systems or clinic systems on this issue at all. And I stay in frequent contact with those individuals. So to answer your question, I have not heard from them any concerns about this. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would uh, Representative Marquardt yield to a question? Representative Marquardt, will you yield to a question? Yes, Madam Speaker. He will yield. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Marquardt, uh, I went to school up in Moorhead, uh, and I'm uh, fairly familiar with a couple of the hospitals up that way, both in Ada and Detroit Lakes, uh, in the Sencha healthcare system. I pose the same question to you that I posed to Representative Sandstead. Uh, both, that, both those organizations underneath the heading of Essentia have had uh, a very trying time uh, making sure that uh, critical care as well as uh, care for those walking in the doors is provided. And, and certainly we, we laud that effort, but it, has, it comes down to dollars and cents. And so with regard to that, uh, Representative Marquardt, what uh, conversations have you had with those uh, uh, panels uh, within the both Ada, Detroit Lakes, uh, and, and how are they affected by that? And uh, what will reductions in the 340B benefits have on their balance sheets? Representative Marquardt. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Representative Albright, uh, while I am in contact uh, with those groups, uh, they have not uh, talked to me or reached out to me on 340B. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm wondering if Representative Wolgamont would yield to a question. He will yield. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Wolgamont, St. Cloud Hospital. It's a pretty big uh, employer in the St. Cloud area. I uh, have had occasion to visit with them about their health care system, particularly in the orthopedic wing. Uh, these are very trying times, as you can well imagine, for any health care system. Uh, St. Cloud not being exempted from that. In your conversations with them with regard to this provision and with regard to the effect that 340B positively has on, on their balance sheet, I'm wondering if you could share with us those conversations and what effect that would have on their balance sheet as well as the delivery of care uh, to the folks in your uh, district. Representative Wolgamont. Madam Speaker, Representative Albright, I'm very proud to represent the St. Cloud Hospital. I'm proud of the care that it provides for people all throughout central Minnesota. I have a weekly check-in with folks from St. Cloud Hospital to make sure that we're staying in touch on things that are important. Uh, similar to, to Representative Marquardt, they have not expressed any concern to me about this. Uh, but I will be glad when they, as this topic comes up, I've uh, had deep conversations with the chair labeling about this, and I'm excited to vote for this bill because it does have funding that will make these uh, 340B providers whole. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, members, uh, I certainly have appreciated the work that uh, Representative Liebling has brought forward on this bill. She speaks about a pot of money that uh, she hopes will be enough. Um, notwithstanding that uh, laudable goal of putting some money in there, I think uh, uh, the, the, she's, missed the, she's missing the mark, missing the target. Uh, hospitals have struggled mightily. Uh, you know, to break even, thanks to, in, in, in due part, uh, the COVID and the effects of the shutdown on medical services in the past year. Um, let's not make matters worse uh, by cutting out the legs from underneath their balance sheets with this type of an amendment and this type of a clause in this bill. Uh, I'm also very concerned about folks like uh, that support Children's of Minnesota 
Uh, you want to talk about hospitals in Albert Lee to Twin Cities. They're all under the same type of duress. Let's, at a time when we can ill afford to not support them, let's support the amendment and make, that, make sure that they are all, in effect, uh, supportive of the communities they serve and take this under advisement. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Sibley, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam S uh, Speaker and members. Yeah, I rise in support of the uh, Schumacher Amendment. And uh, I would have a question for uh, Chair Liebling, if she would yield. Chair I will Liebling. yield. She will yield. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker and Chair Liebling. You know, I th if I understood your comments right, you don't really know the amount of money from the 340B program that is going to these hospitals uh, versus the pot of money that you have to replace it. Wouldn't it make more sense to find out first, you know, you want some transparency in the program to know what's actually going on. I can understand that, especially since it's taxpayer dollars. But uh, wouldn't it make more sense to find that out first before, for, you know, cutting these hospitals and medical facilities off from this 340B uh, money that comes to them, if I understood you correctly. Representative Liebling. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Madam Speaker, and, and uh, Representative Grunhagen. You know, what makes sense to me is to stop allowing these um, managed care organizations to um, be spending more and more of our taxpayer money when we have the ability to stop that flow significantly. Every one of these organizations employs a PBM and the arrangements they have with those PBMs are completely outside of anything that we have the ability to uh, look into. There is no transparency in this program. And it was only when this bill started to really get traction that we started to hear about this subsidy that is flowing with our medical assistance dollars to these other organizations. So yeah, it's, it's a little bit difficult here. I mean, we even heard from the, um, the uh, Minnesota Hospital Association that reporting is gonna be a real problem for them because they don't know how much they're getting. Well, we don't know how much we're spending. They don't know how much we're getting. We are doing our best to try to keep these organizations whole. And um, we're gonna have to just try to find out here. But um, if the organizations themselves don't know how much they're getting, then I think that um, it's probably not an enormous part of their revenue. And I think when we spend money on medical assistance, and we spend money to provide health care for needy people in our state, that we have the right to have those dollars go to health care, not to go to line the pockets of PBMs. And when you look at the trends in what is being spent by DHS under the fee-for-service program and what the managed care organizations are spending through their PBMs, the trends are very different. It is a much sharper upward curve through the PBMs. So um, I'm thank you for asking me the question, Representative Grunhagen. You've probably saved me my closing speech on this amendment uh, because this is uh, absolutely um, what we have in the bill, carving this out, managing it in, in, in one way. And remember, this is our public program. This is medical assistance. And so instead of farming out chunks of this to different organizations and letting them profit off of this and take our Medicaid dollars and use them for some other thing, what we're trying to do is bring this all back together and run it in one um, pot, if you will, efficiently. And we are trying to keep these other organizations whole and it may not be perfect, in fact, they may do better under our bill. Representative Grunhagen, they might be doing better under our bill, but at least we've got an amount that's appropriated for that purpose, as opposed to just a, an open hole in the bottom of the sieve where the money keeps running out. So members, I'm going to ask you uh, to vote down this underlying amendment. Thank you. 
The member from Sibley, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for that response, Chair Liebley. But it does sound like you're not sure how much money they're getting. You know, hospitals don't have a PBM. But, uh, and you know I have concerns about PBMs too. And uh, the amount of money they take on discounts and also as far as this program. But I think it, it would be wise members and prudent to find out first how much money is going to the PBMs versus actually to the hospital, and then make a prudent uh, decision on that. Uh, that makes sense to me, because members, our hospitals, especially the rural hospitals, are operating on very uh, narrow margins, you know, one to two percent. And to take this money away without knowing exactly what they're getting uh, would be a blow to them. If you remember, I shared on the uh, House floor here, the Star Tribune did a front page article that 30 rural or 30 hospitals in the state of Minnesota were in danger of closing financially. So taking this without knowing all the facts on it doesn't seem to be a wise step or a prudent step. To find out the transparency of what actually is going on, I support uh, Chair Liebling on that. But I think before we go with a taking that funding away from these medical facilities, uh, before we know how much the PPMs are keeping versus what they're getting, is not a, a good step to do because the, the uh, ripple effect of that decision might be the closure of medical facilities and less access for your constituents uh, in the rural area and even in the metro area. So members, I would vote green on the uh, Schumacher Amendment. Further discussion? Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I want to just bring a little clarity to uh, some of the comments that were made by Chair Liebling. Um, there are no hidden subsidies. This is a federal program. If there was anybody, any entity that wanted reporting uh, from the money that was flowing into entities from uh, appropriations that they make, it would be the federal government, particularly CMS. Uh, so to the point that it was made about that we don't know how much money is flowing into these hospitals, the very question that I posed to the three um, um, members from the other side of the aisle points to the fact that if they were asking the questions of their clinics and their hospitals, it's on the balance sheet. It's readily available to be known and to, su su to suggest that we don't know the number. And so we're just going to put this pot of money over here and people are just going to dip into it until we know what it is and investigate it. My goodness, if you ask a question, you know, pick up the phone, make a call. They know what's on their balance sheet. You don't need an amendment like this and a provision in a bill like this to get at the root of, what is, of why hospitals are struggling. Thank you, members. Further discussion, the member from Hennepin, Representative Elkins. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Just to, to throw a little bit more light on the subject, the 340B program is a federal program. Drug companies that which participate in Medicare are required to participate. Under the 340B program, drug manufacturers are required to sell to provider organizations which provide indigent care drugs at a steep discount to provide them to those customers. What we don't know is that, but we know we know what happens on a massive scale, but we don't know the degree, uh, is that hospitals and um, their intermediaries are buying drugs under the 340B dis, uh, program at big discounts and then marking them up and selling them. And that's where their revenue comes from. So let's be clear about this. We, we, just, we know that that happens. We just don't know to the degree to which hospitals and, and their intermediaries are inappropriately marking up the price of the discounted drugs under the 340B program. Further discussion? The author of the amendment, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I would uh, request a roll call to begin with. A roll call having been requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Thank you, Madam Schumacher. Speaker. Uh, members, I would ask as you're voting today not to be hypnotized by the complexity. That's something that happens quite often in the health and human service area. We get wrapped up in details and we forget the bigger picture and forget the bigger policies. This one's pretty simple, members. We know that there's a 340B drug program. 
We know that money goes into our most vulnerable hospitals throughout the state, and we know that that money is required to be spent on the expansion of health services to the patients and the local communities. What we don't know is if we pass this bill, what funds are going to be stripped out and choked off from our vulnerable hospitals, what funds are going to be coming back in, and to what hospitals they'll be coming back into, and we don't know what that money is going to be intended to go through because it is not explicitly listed in the bill before us. And so, members, with that, I would ask for a green vote on the A51 amendment. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amended amendment. Members voting remotely, please vote. The clerk will call the names of all those members who have not yet voted. Draskowski. Draskowski, aye. Draskowski, aye. Frazier. Frazier, no. Frazier, no. Garofalo. Garofalo. Hanson R. Hanson R, no. Hanson R, no. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. McDonald. McDonald, I. McDonald, I. Miller. Miller, I. Moran. Moran, no. Moran, no. Nash. Nash, I. Nash, I. Nelson N. Nelson N, I. Nelson N. I. Olson B. Olson B. I. Olson B. I. Pinto. Pinto, no. Sundin. No. Sundin, no. Swazinski. Swazinski, I. Swazinski, I. Zhang J. Zhang J, no. Zhang J, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 62 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Schumacher moves to amend House Bill number 2128, the third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A50-1. To the author of the amendment, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, the A50 amendment tries to address the idea that this bill brings forward with their carve-outs and tries to stabilize what is going to become unmanaged care in this state. What this amendment proposes to do is that as these carve-outs uh, come about in this bill, that a third-party administrator takes, takes the work on so that we can ensure that managed care will still continue, and I would ask for your support. Discussion to the amendment. The member from Olmsted, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Schumacher. So this is an interesting amendment because um, having a DHS use a third party administer, administrator for these uh, various things is not a terrible idea. In fact, under the dental carve out that's in the bill and under the non-emergency medical transportation carve out in the bill, they are already using a third party administrator. So that part of the bill is completely unnecessary. Um, in terms of using a third party administrator for the, um, for the pharmacy carve out, you know, it's not a 
that might not be a bad idea. And I think that they should, in fact, look at that. But I do not think it would be a good idea to mandate that in this uh, in the bill. And certainly um, the other part of it, as I said, is superfluous. So um, also, of course, you know, the costs of this are pretty much unknown. And the, the, the amendment could be out of balance, in fact, because of the cost of doing that, which could be more than, than what we have here um, in the bill. It's taking it from the uh, DHS operating adjustment. And since we don't know the cost, but I'm not, I'm not gonna raise a point of order on that. I would just ask members to vote no on this amendment. Discussion to the amendment. Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I would request a roll call, Madam Speaker. A roll call having been requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And we are projecting out of these carve outs to save or to collect another $97 million from uh, the, the taxpayers. And what we're going to get for that is unmanaged care. This amendment provides that that unmanaged care will become a little bit more managed, and I would ask for a green vote. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. <laughs> Members voting remotely, please vote. The clerk will call the names of all those members who have not yet voted. Anderson. Anderson, aye. Anderson, aye. Frazier. Frazier, no. Frazier, no. Hanson, R. Hanson, R, no. Hanson, R, no. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Kosnick. Kosnick, aye. Kosnick, aye. McDonald. McDonald, aye. McDonald, aye. Nash. Nash, aye. Nash I, Nelson N. Nelson N, I. Nelson N, I. Olson B. Olson B, I. Olson B, I. Sundin. Sundin, no. Sundin, no. Swazinski. Swazinski. Zhang J. Zhang Jay. The clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Keel moves to amend House Law number 2128. The third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A18-1. The member from Polk, Representative Keel. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, first of all, I would like to ask for a roll call for this. A roll amendment. call having been requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Keel. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, this bill dramatically uh, expands the definition of assisted living facilities. And that change uh, had no hearings and does not have support among the long-term care providers. It would include independent living facilities in the, def in the definition of assisted living. Um, this amendment simply deletes uh, that change and we would leave the definition of assisted living facilities alone. Representative Keel, if you're still speaking, you have cut out. Oh, man. Oh. Can you hear me okay we now? Got, we got you back now, so try again. Great. 
I apologize. I thought I had really good reception, but maybe not. Um, anyway, uh, this this uh, amendment uh, does not uh, delete the changes that the definition that we directed last um, session with uh, assisted living and uh, that licensure. So uh, it was a, a crowning achievement of the uh, massive reform that was provided by the providers and the seniors that agreed on these changes. So we wouldn't have been able to make the unnecessary changes um, that would have uh, been a support to all the groups. So I, I am really concerned about the fact that we are including independent living. Um, I happen to have had a little bit more experience with that. And I, my other concern is when we didn't have the bill heard, we also didn't um, ask seniors, what, what do you want? Many of them don't want as much uh, control as uh, we would like, especially as uh, children of those family members moving into an assisted living or a independent uh, living uh, option. So I did read, um, uh, uh, Chair uh, Schultz sent me um, the ombudsman's concerns and I think we need to take this slow. Uh, this is a mistake to include independent living options for seniors, especially those who wanna live close to home and connected to their communities and families. Um, do not feel we should rush into this language and could hurt seniors. So as, as I feel this is a mistake, um, want to fix it. Uh, let's use the interim next session to actually vet this change, have time to talk to seniors about what they really want to have in an independent uh, living situation, or even those who are a little bit, you know, have disabilities that need services possibly, but uh, also move into an independent living um, just, just because of their personal situations. So um, I'd also like to hear from landlords who operate these uh, so that we can uh, provide um, uh, safety for people, but also not uh, these changes may uh, derive up the cost of independent living and assisted living and uh, limit the housing options that um, we so, so uh, sincerely want to have for our seniors. Thank you, Madam Chair. Discussion to the amendment. The member from St. Louis, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, I urge you to vote no on this A18 amendment. This change is needed to close a potential loophole that would allow certain facilities that should be licensed to evade licensing. The, a significant goal of assisted living licensure was not only to protect our older adults from significant maltreatment that had been occurring, but it was to streamline the contracts and protections under one framework. So if a facility is off offering uh, sleeping with services for assisted living as defined in the bill we passed in 2019, then they should be licensed. The goal was not to narrowly apply assisted living licensure to facilities that labeled themselves as assisted living or to be limited to situations where the same entity owned and operated the housing and services. So this makes sure that if you have two different legal entities offering the housing and the services, that that facility should still be licensed as assisted living with services. And that's the intent of this correction. And I did circulate a letter from the Office of Ombudsperson for Long-Term Care, Care that this language is needed. This is being requested by our advocates and stakeholders to protect older adults. So members, I urge you to vote no on this amendment. Further discussion to the amendment. Further discussion. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will- Madam Speaker. Okay. Represent Madam Speaker. Representative Keel, I bet that's you. Yes, thank you. I couldn't find my hand. And Anyway, um, I, you know, I would, I have to disagree with some of this. Having had uh, move family members into an independent assisted living, what um, I probably should ask uh, Chair Schultz, uh, this means that uh, my family member who is in an independent situation with uh, living, but 55 plus, and should request uh, assistance, uh, somebody that would come in a few hours a day or, uh, you know, 
uh, different services, let's just put it that way, you're requiring that then that facility would be um, under that uh, licensure also, correct? I will yield. Oh, are you, yep, you're, sorry. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So if it's a facility that is offering services and those services are listed in our uh, statute for licensure, then they will have to get licensure. If it's a just senior living independent housing and no services are offered, they won't be, have to be licensed. If it's an independent senior housing facility and you're personally getting a PCA to come in, you're contracting individually with a, a, a service that does not need to be licensed. Representative Keel. Uh, I, I, I still think this is something that we should bring forward in the interim and um, in the next session. Um, I, I don't think this is as desperately needed as getting this licensure off the ground that is just starting. And we wanna make sure that we don't make this so difficult that people don't have the housing and the cost. Um, I just believe this is going to drive up cost for senior citizens. I'm just shocked at how in those costs have increased already. Um, and facilities are going to have to um, uh, charge that because they don't have any way to uh, fund those sources. So um, members, I would ask you to um, vote green on this amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Members voting remotely, please vote. The clerk will call the names of all those members who have not yet voted. Frazier. Frazier votes no. Frazier no. Frederick. <clears throat> Frederick. Frederick votes no. Frederick no. Hanson R. Hanson R. No. Hanson R. No. Houseman. Houseman no. Houseman no. Kosnick. Kosnick I. Kosnick I. McDonald. McDonald, I. McDonald, I. Nash. Nash, I. Nash, I. Nelson, N. Nelson, N, I. Nelson, N, I. Swazinski. Swazinski. Tice. Tice, I. <clears throat> Tice, I. Thompson. Thompson, no. Thompson, no. Zhang J. Zhang J. The clerk will close the roll. <clears throat> there being 62 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Munson moves to amend Senate file number 2128. The third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A-104. To the author of the amendment, the member from Blue Earth, Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, this amendment, the 104 amendment, is a form of a bill that I've authored called the Patient Right to Shop Act. Um, it's similar to Representative Elkins' bill, who's carrying it also in the House this year, uh, House File 1837, um, however, with one change to, to his bill, um, in that it doesn't require health plans to create an account for every enrollee. Um, I understand that 
the, the cost of these health plans, uh, this account is around $5 a month. And so then it would be the responsibility of the enrollee under this amendment. Um, not everyone will shop for care. I understand that. But it doesn't mean that we should be denying patients the right to be informed of the cost and give them the opportunity to choose which provider they trust. Allowing patients to purchase a service based on this radical idea of giving them, you know, of, of quality of care and the price, it shouldn't be foreign to Minnesotans. Uh, we do this in every other sector of our economy. Um, healthcare is is the you know the last sector where you you make a major purchase decision and you don't get a bill for uh, a month or more. Um, in this debate today on on all these amendments, you've heard a lot about um, controlling the costs. Um, creating reports to see what, what plans are spending. Um, there's been some great initiatives on lowering the cost of pharmaceuticals, which makes up a good portion of care. But lowering the underlying cost of care should be our focus at the legislature. And, and we can really do this by empowering patients to make the right decisions uh, for their plans. And this is especially important because the deductibles have skyrocketed in recent years. I um, mean, we have families that have uh, more than ten or $12,000 deductibles, which means that money that they spend is their money. And why on earth they can't have full price transparency and understand what the costs are going to be and perhaps um, where they could go to find those services uh, cheaper for non-emergency services is, is a... Uh, something we should be focusing on at the legislature. Um, and I'm disappointed that we have not been uh, bringing more transparency and more competition to the markets. Uh, instead, we're having insurance companies demanding um, that people must be in their network um, to, to, uh, and, and not be able to see what things cost. Now, the Right to Shop Act doesn't just bring full price transparency and let people shop for care, but it also allows people to share in the savings, which is how this, this type of legislation has been effective in several other states that it's been implemented. If a patient finds a service that is cheaper than what they would have, their provider would have been paid in network, then that patient must receive at least 50% of the savings. And the additional savings would go to the health plan or the pool of other people in the plan. So you're lowering the cost for everyone else in this, in this insurance pool. Um, there are so many services, and I mean, you've seen articles uh, reported nationally on uh, procedures that are elective where there are tens of thousands of dollars difference, sometimes with the same doctor, just instead of at one hospital, they're at a clinic across the street. Providing full price transparency would allow people to not only lower the cost of care by, by choosing services that are less expensive with doctors that they perhaps feel uh, are more trusted, but it would drive more competition, lower these costs significantly, lowering the healthcare costs for everybody in the pool. And we wouldn't be sitting here at the legislature talking about how we can subsidize insurance costs with taxpayer money because we would be empowering patients to make these decisions. This has been uh, implemented in other states. Like I said, it saved tens of millions of dollars in the first, in the first year. Um, there was a fiscal note pulled in this bill it was a $12 million fiscal note just for the state of Minnesota to implement this. Uh, half that money was because the state of Minnesota would have to set up $5 a month accounts for people, whether they shop for care or not. But the other half, the $6 million of cost to the state of Minnesota was because the state would have to pay out $6 million to patients because they would find services cheaper elsewhere, which actually isn't a cost, it's a savings. This plan would save a lot of money for the state of Minnesota. And of course, it would, it would generate a, a ton of savings for the private health insurance pools and would lower costs for the people that are most significantly impacted by this. Um, and that's private insurance on the private employer market and in the individual market. Um, so I, I won't be asking for a vote on this today. Um, I didn't wanna wait until midnight to speak to what we should be working on. Um, but I and I will withdraw the amendment. But uh, thank you, members, for listening to this. And I hope we can in the future work on initiatives that are patient focused, as opposed to fighting over uh, insurance and uh, hospital association lobbyists and pharmaceutical lobbyists and what their talking points are. Thank you. The amendment has been withdrawn. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Grunhagen moves to amend House File Number Twenty One Twenty Eight. The third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A62 
one. The member from Sibley, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam, Madam Speaker and members. Yeah, this, uh, before I address the amendment, I just want to say something positive about Chair Liebling's bill. She did increase the uh, Medicaid reimbursement rate up to $10.77 on pharmacies for independent drug stores. That is a great uh, benefit to uh, independent pharmacies who've suffered. I'll have more to say about that on the final reading, but I wanted to uh, just compliment her right off the bat. Uh, what this amendment does, members, you had a chance to vote on this by uh, Representative Tim uh, O'Driscoll. So I'm gonna give you a second chance to do the right thing, okay? I had some additional information I wanted to share on this and give you a second chance as to why this is vitally uh, necessary. The amendment would extend reinsurance. Reinsurance has worked. It will hold down cost and brought stability to the individual market. This year, thanks to reinsurance, we actually had new insurers enter the market for the first time in years. We now have competition between plans in every county across the state for the first time in years. We would be leaving federal money on the table. There's, there's money available to pay for this. We don't need to spend one more cent to extend reinsurance, so why wouldn't we do it? Members, just to give you a little bit more information about this, basically what it does, you know, when you take underwriting away from the health insurance industry, just like any other industry, Premiums go up dramatically, okay? And, uh, and your, your claims go up also dramatically. The result is that what reinsurance does between 50 and 250,000, it actually helps pay those claims to keep the health insurance premiums down and more reasonable. Members, it's similar to the old MCHA plan that Minnesota had, which if you weren't able to get insurance in the private market, you could be, because of uh, health conditions, you could get insured with the MC, MCHA, and they would actually uh, cover you and pay for your pre-existing conditions. So members, um, one of the reasons this is uh, uh, important to keep the uh, private market viable is because of cost shifting, as you're well aware, Doctors and hospitals and medical facilities lose money on the reimbursement of Medicare and Medicaid. And I'll have more to say about that in a future amendment here. And what private health insurance has done since 1965 through cost shifting, and that's one of the reasons your premium's gone up, it's bailed out the government program so our medical facilities and hospitals and doctors can stay open rather than lose money every time as far as their operation is concerned. Now, I know some members have concerns, even within our, on the Republican side, that this is just, uh, you know, using taxpayer dollars to subsidize the private market. And I agree with that. This is not a long-term solution, members. This is a short-term solution till we can reform the uh, health care market and actually address the increasing costs. Now, I have another amendment coming up here shortly that will actually do that. But members, uh, I would urge you between the reinsurance and the 8.5% cap that, that's coming down as far as income is concerned to spend on health insurance premiums, I think we could actually see health insurance premiums decline slightly in the state of Minnesota. And we know the burden that it is on our businesses and our families, our schools, count, city and county governments. So members, uh, this is a second chance to do the right thing, and I would urge you to vote green. The member from Olmsted, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Grunhagen. Well, uh, we did vote this down before. I think it got about 76 votes against, and uh, I expect it'll get something similar to that now. You know, if this is needed as a short-term thing, um, the American Rescue Plan has made this pretty much just irrelevant because premiums are going to be capped now for everyone who buys their plan through Mincher. Premiums are now gonna be capped at 8.5% of income for everybody. So right now, as we talked about this before, if you your your premiums are capped, you get a, a subsidy 
um, up to 400% of the federal poverty level. And over that, you're on your own. And that's where people are really hurting because premiums are very expensive and people have then been basically paying the full freight themselves. Well, that's not gonna be happening anymore. Everybody is going to have premiums that are affordable for them according to their income. So this is not needed. Um, I just also want to briefly refute uh, something. The, the comparison to increasing rates for pharmacists to dispense drugs under medical assistance um, does not apply here. That is an, a small increase that we hope will help the independent pharmacies. We'll see if that really does, but we hope that it will. But um, under this, the, the money is going to the insurance companies. And then you hope that they're going to reduce the premiums. I mean, that has happened. They've reduced some premiums, but there's absolutely no requirement for that. And, um, and also the state, in fact, loses money. I, I wish I had the, the um, accounting in front of me, but actually this reinsurance reduces other payments that the state gets because of our um, payments that we get for our BHP, or in other words, for Minnesota Care, that are based on the uh, premium. So this is not, uh, this is a pretty mixed blessing for the state fiscally, and that is uh, putting it in its best light. So members, you voted this down again. I'm going to ask you, i uh, sorry, you voted this down before. I'm going to ask you to vote it down again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Speaker. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, uh, Representative Liebling. No, the the Medicaid reimbursement on the pharmacy was just, I know that's not part of this amendment. I was just uh, giving you a compliment, <laughs> okay? Uh, the other thing to understand, members, as far as the private health insurance market's concerned, prior to Obamacare, we had over 300,000 individual health insurance plans in the state of Minnesota. Now we're down to about 150 to 160,000 individual plans. In the industry, that's called a death spiral. And that, in other words, we're going the wrong direction. And again, it's the private market that has bailed out the losses of the government programs to help keep your health insurance facilities and hospitals, doctors open because they lose money on the reimbursement of Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, the other thing, um, I would just, oh, Blue Cross did a study a while back and said if this wasn't done, premiums would increase uh, to the tune of 50% over and above what they are currently, which would be devastating on the private market. So members, I encourage a green vote. Again, I understand we're using government money. This is a temporary solution until we can get to reforms that actually bring down the cost of health care and make health insurance uh, more affordable for the average person. So um, Madam Speaker, I'd ask for a roll call. A roll call having been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Members voting remotely, please vote. The clerk will call the names of all those members who have not yet voted. Haley. Haley. Hanson R. Hanson R, no. Hanson R, no. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Kosnick. Kosnick, I. Kosnick, I. McDonald. McDonald, I. McDonald, I. Nash. 
Nash I. Nash I. Nelson N. Nelson N. I. Nelson N. I. Swazinski. Swazinski I. Swazinski I. Tice. Tice I. Tice I. Thompson. 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 Thompson, no. Thompson, no. West. West. Zhang J. Zhang J. The clerk will close the roll. Haley votes aye. Lucero, I'll let the clerk will call. <laughs> Lucero? Uh, I should have a no vote up there. West I. West I. Madam Speaker, uh, point of parliamentary inquiry. We're in a roll call clerk. right now. Will well, you call my name, clerk, I just wanna. Clerk will close the roll. on there or have to be added. Okay, so it'll be 54. I don't know, I lost the numbers here. 54, what's, what are the numbers? 56. 56, 2, up to 76. Okay. 56 aye and 76 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Grunhagen moves to amend House File number 2128, the third engrossment as amended. The in amendment is coded A41-1. The member from Sibley, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Yeah, uh, what this amendment does, it deletes uh, the section in the bill that allows DHS to work with the federal government to create a public option. We know where public options are going. They're going uh, towards a single payer. Um, members, that's not what we want uh, this section to do. Instead of studying whether a public option would be good for the state, this language directs DHS to develop a proposal for a public option. The language says DHS is supposed to return to us with their legislative changes. Expanding government health care is not the solution. Explain uh, why government-run health care would be bad for insurance and for the state. And Madam Chair, I, Madam Speaker, I would request a roll call. A roll call having been requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Grunhagen. Okay, members, we need to understand the devastating consequences of government-run health care in terms of underpaying our health care providers and the stress it'll bring to one of the best health care systems in the world here in Minnesota. Uh, we don't need this study or this proposal, which by the way, according to the fiscal note on line 727, it's gonna cost about 680,000. So if you vote for this proposal, you will actually bring your omnibus bill into balance <laughs> fiscally with additional money left over. The reason we don't need the 680,000 spent is because Vermont already passed a single payer and, they, and it failed members. California, so they voted to get rid of it. So California also considered it. When they looked at the cost, over $400 billion a year and the, the increase in taxes, they decided not to, to, to pass it. Okay? So the study is already in. And uh, members, if you don't want to believe Vermont or California, here's a good actual quote from John Delaney. He was a presidential candidate this last election cycle in the primary for the Democrats. So this is an actual comment from John Delaney, a Democrat. 
Listen to what he says about government-run health. Well, what he's talking about is Medicare for all. Not even taking into consideration Medicaid, but just talking about Medicare for all. Here's his exact quote. If you go to every hospital in this country and you ask them one question, which is, how would it have been for you last year if every one of your bills were paid at the Medicare rate? Every single hospital administrator said they would close. Did you hear that, members? At the Medicare rate, which is better than the Medicaid rate, according to John Delaney, a presidential candidate for, for, uh, for the Democrats in the primary, that was his statement. And that's just what I've been trying to tell you, and that's what the facts show. That's what Vermont found out, and also California. Now, members, a few uh, sessions ago, and I believe it was authored by Representative Munson, we passed an amendment to disclose the top 25 medical costs at your clinic uh, to the public for commercial insurance, private insurance, I mean, Medicare and Medicaid. So people can, you can actually go down to your local clinic or hospital and look at the reimbursement rates. They're supposed to have it posted publicly. I've done that at my local hospitals and they do have it posted. You do have to look at it for a little bit. But I, I'll just give you uh, four examples of that. Under a knee x-ray, and this is on average members, this comes from the Minnesota Department of uh, Health. On a knee x-ray, commercial reinsurance reimburses in the state of Minnesota about $72 for a knee x-ray. Medicare reimburses, on average, about $32. Medicaid reimburses at about $22. They lose money, members, on Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement. That's why John Delaney said what he said. Secondly, a knee MRI, commercial reimburses on average $851. Medicare, $242. Medicaid, 172. Members, they can't keep their doors open for access for your, for your constituents to get the health care they need at those reimbursement rates. And to try to raise those reimbursement rates will bankrupt the state if you try to increase that. And then for a 15-minute office visit, members, on average, commercial insurance reimburses at $150. Medicare, on average, reimburses $73, about less than half, and Medicaid at $56. Members, this is what we're talking about. We don't need to spend $680,000 to figure that out. The, the studies have already been done. To go to a public option is going to damage and cripple one of the best health care systems in the world. People come from all over the world to Minnesota for health care. Why do you want to damage it with a public option? We need to reinvigorate the private sector, which is what my next amendment's about. Members, you can also look at the growth of government health care. And you can read my book if you want. <laughs> but in 1968, Medicare cost $5 billion, okay? It was projected to cost $10 billion by 1990. Okay, those were the projections. The actual cost turned out to be over $100 billion by 1990, and by 1992 it had grown to $136 billion. So instead of $10 billion, it grew 10 times faster. Government health care, oh, by the way, Medicaid, during that same period of time, grew 3,050% from $3.5 billion to $108 billion. It grew by 3,050%. Members, we cannot sustain that in, and with those types of increases that actually happened. That's documented. 
And again, Tom, De or, uh, Tom Gillespie, our former state demographer, did a study on this. And he basically said back in 2010, if you don't get the cost of government health care, that's at the low reimbursement rates under control, there will be no additional money at some point in the future for roads or bridges, K-12, or higher ed. So members, going down this single payer path is going to be a disaster, not just for our health care system, but for, for the funding of our K-12, higher ed, and even roads and bridges. That's not my opinion. That's documented studies right here in the state of Minnesota. Please come to your senses on this, okay? The other thing about government health care, when they lose money hand over fist, guess what they do in other countries? They ration it. You have to stand in line and wait to get health care. I'm friends with a former doctor from Canada who practices in Eden Prairie. He's written a book, The End of the American Revolution, on government health care. He was a fanatical believer in Canadian single-payer health care. However, as he saw it in practice over a period of years, he realized that it did not provide the care or the update of innovation that was necessary to give the best quality health care and access to Canadians. So he left Canada, and in one particular case that he shares in his book, his patient actually died by not getting the care that he needed uh, on a timely basis. So members, we don't need to spend $680,000 uh, to do this and come up with a plan that's never going to work, which has been repeated over and over and over again, even in our own country. So members, I would ask uh, for a green vote on this amendment. Put your omnibus bill in balance and remove this wasteful spending for a public option. Please vote green. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Discussion to the amendment. The member from Wright, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Grunhagen, for bringing your amendment. I think you have just a little bit of passion for the issue, and I appreciate your expertise on health care and health insurance. Uh, just uh, would you yield for a question, Representative Grunhagen? He will yield. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Grunhagen, in your expert opinion, being in the health uh, care or health insurance industry for the uh, last 30 some years, uh, was Obamacare a success in our country and in our state? Representative Grunhagen. I think I previously stated my opinion on that. I just can't remember it. No, <laughs> no it's been a disaster. Uh, uh, for our health care industry, for our hospitals, the medical facilities. And uh, we definitely need real health care reform that brings down the cost of health care. You know, one of the things I'll bring out in a future amendment, and Obamacare exasperated, is overhead or administrative cost. We have grown administrative costs and overhead for our medical facilities and insurance companies exponentially. And uh, I'll go into that later, but uh, that's what Obamacare did. It didn't do much for actually ac access to care. In fact, we had a 2017 study show shared in HHS a couple years ago. It was done in 2017. And it showed that since in 2017, 1.7 million Minnesotans did not access the health care they needed. Uh, because of high premiums and high deductibles. That's what Obamacare has done. People aren't going to get the health, going to get the health care they actually need because of the high premiums and deductibles. And we've heard from our hospitals in HHS, people aren't paying those high deductibles. The hospital's being left to pick up the bag. So our losses by the hospitals due to Obamacare uh, have, have grown exponentially. But, so, uh, no, Obamacare has been a disaster, and I'm hoping that the Supreme Court will take the final nail in the coffin and put an end to it. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative McDonald. Representative McDonald. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Grunhagen. I think we all know how this vote is going to go, but uh, members, uh, just real quickly, uh, Representative Grunhagen is an expert in this field for the last uh, 35, 40 years. And uh, what he says is factual and truth. It is crippling our nation and our state healthcare. And these simple solutions that he proposes today are the answer. Now, I know how you're gonna vote. Most likely you're not even listening. But I will, with all due respect, perhaps you are. I shouldn't have said that. But uh, really, you would be wise to open your ears and your heart and vote green for Representative Grunhagen's uh, amendment that really will help get the gear started in getting, getting our state back to affordable health care and affordable insurance. So with that, I urge a green vote. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from St. Louis, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I urge a no vote on this amendment. I have a little bit of knowledge of health care and economics, and I just want to quickly talk about some points that were brought up. First of all, um, this is a study of a public option, and it's very broad, and it would do, uh, we have to do something because we spent hundreds of millions of dollars of state and federal money on reinsurance that was supposed to be a bridge to something. And we need to build that something because people in my district and across the state and country need to be able to afford healthcare and many cannot. We have people who are employed that get employer sponsored insurance that can't afford their high deductible. Prices are out of control. I agree with Representative Grunhagen that we have to control our, our healthcare costs. And Republicans had an opportunity to repeal the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, when they controlled the federal government. They did not repeal it. In fact, the Affordable Care Act is popular now more than ever before. 54%, according to a Kaiser Family Foundation survey, 54% of people in this country have a favorable view of the Affordable Care Act because they realize that's how many people get affordable health insurance. Only 39% have an unfavorable view. So things are really changing. I urge Representative Grunhagen to um, bring a new edition of his book forward, which I did read. I will recommend uh, other books, one by Uwe Reinhardt named Price, called Priced Out, and the other one called The Price We Pay by Dr. Markery um, for other opinions on healthcare reform. Also, um, we, we ration healthcare today. We ration healthcare by ability to pay. People who cannot pay for healthcare do not get access to healthcare. So it's rationed already by ability to pay and we need to address that. That's why studying a public option so we have alternatives um, for individuals to buy affordable healthcare. And it's not government run healthcare, the public option study bill that I brought forward House File 11 was actually using private markets to operate, uh, uh, expand Minnesota care to make it eligible to other people who can't afford their health insurance. And the private health plan negotiated reimbursement rates with providers. That's how it works in Minnesota care. So we're subsidizing health care, but we're not operating health care. We're not managing health care delivery. We're just subsidizing it. And right now, you know, even what you, what many call the private market, that's not private. It's completely subsidized by the federal government through premium tax credits, through huge tax breaks when you buy your insurance through your employer. So we do need to evaluate something because we cannot continue subsidizing health plans in the form of reinsurance. We have to build something. And the public option study is a good idea. I urge your support, but please vote down this amendment. Further discussion, Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Schultz, um, I've spent some time uh, looking at uh, the economics as well. I would remind you sometime when you get back to your uh, uh, office uh, to look up the law of scarcity and uh, remind yourself in terms of how that affects healthcare. Members, this is, this is not a study. It is very plain as you read the language that it is intentioned to establish. 
Now, whether you want to you want to talk about uh, semantics, we can talk about semantics that in some of the other amendments to the amendments that will be coming up. But when a when a study costs six hundred and eighty thousand dollars, there's a little more going on than just making an assessment as to whether or not something might work in the government-run healthcare system uh, that is proposed. There is very little about this that uh, talks to a study. And uh, for that uh, measure, I'm wondering if uh, Representative Schultz would uh, yield to a question. I will yield. She will yield. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Schultz, could you identify and extrapolate in terms of what goes into a study that costs $680,000? Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And you know, the, the health plans and other stakeholders that I've been meeting with throughout this session, and I've done a lot of work and met with a lot of groups, um, including the uh, local chambers of commerce, um, Minnesota Catholic Charities, uh, I've like 30 organizations to bring forward a public option bill. But what they, many of them uh, asked was for an actuarial analysis to see what would happen to the risk in the remaining market, in the individual market, which by the way, is only 3% of those with health insurance coverage are in this individual market. What would happen to that market if a public option did go forward? So the cost is high because you know, the stakeholders interested in learning about this know that they want the, the, those who would argue against a public option are concerned about how risk is spread across um, these different products. And so an actuarial analysis to be sound, you have to spend some money. Um, and we're gonna get great information going forward on how to actually build something and implement it. I don't see any proposals coming forward from your caucus to build something that goes beyond reinsurance. And that's, you know, to get a good quality study, we have to spend money, but we've been spending a ton of money on reinsurance, getting very little for it. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Schultz, uh, the language in this bill does not ask for a study. It asks for a proposal of how to enact a single payer system, or as some would suggest, uh, the public option. Uh, there's a ruse by any other definition. Uh, to the extent that you're spending $680,000 to put together an actuarial study, that is incorrect. This is actually putting a proposal together in terms of how to implement a single-payer system in the state of Minnesota. I would appreciate uh, and have appreciated Representative Grunhagen's uh, statements on this. The evidence is pretty clear. Single payer does not work. And to spend $680,000 to get the same result that other countries have already arrived at, I might suggest save the $680,000 and pay for your imbalance that was discussed at the beginning of Representative's uh, 111 amendment, and we can move forward. But this is nothing more than ill-spent money on an answer that we already have for a problem that you're trying to create. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Further discussion? The member from Sibley, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker and members. Yeah. Um, you know, you can believe the rhetoric uh, of those who oppose or support this, or you could believe the actual facts. Go down to your local medical clinic or hospital, look at the 25 most, uh, most uh, used medical procedures, and look at the reimbursement from private insurance, from Medicare and Medicaid, okay? Look at that. And then go talk to your administrator or your doctor and say, can you survive on that? You know what John Delaney found out, a Democrat? They can't. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the access for your children and grandchildren and your constituents. I want them to have access. I don't want them standing in a line waiting. 
You know, as far as not having a proposal, my next amendment will give a solution, members, that actually addresses health care cost. But members, uh, you know, we had the reports of, uh, from even the Star Tribune of hospitals in danger of closing. The public option reimbursement, when the costs go through the roof, will be at Minnesota Care or Medicaid rates. It's not going to sustain them. That is simply a fact. Think about Obamacare and all the promises we had from that. You can keep your doctor if you want. Your premiums are going to go down $2,500 a year. Okay? Uh, you know, and I could go on. The point is, they all turned out to be lies, ladies and gentlemen. They're not true. Obamacare has been a disaster by anybody who credibly looks at the facts. And going down the road of an Obama, of a public option and wasting $680,000 to do that is not in the best interest of your constituents, your medical facilities, or your doctors. Um, well, with that, Madam Speaker, I'd like a roll call on this. Representative Grunhagen, there's already a roll call on the amendment. Oh, okay. Representative Grunhagen. Well, I like to repeat myself, Madam Speaker. <laughs> um, okay, with that, members, even if you don't support this at this time, please take the time during the off session to go down to your hospital and your doctors, read the 25 most, most uh, used medical procedures, read the reimbursement rate, start acting on facts rather than innuendo. And that's what you're getting here today of those who oppose uh, this amendment and support a public option. We don't want to damage one of the best health care systems in the world. We, we want you to get the surgeries you need on a timely basis. The public option is completely the wrong direction. If you support uh, innovation, excellent health care, and access to health care, which I believe all of you want for yourselves and for your constituents and for your children and grandchildren. With that, members, please vote green. Let's take this out, save the money, put the bill in balance, and not waste $680,000. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Members voting remotely, please vote. The clerk will call the names of all those members who have not yet voted. Hanson R. Hanson R. No. Hanson R. No. Houseman. Houseman. No. Houseman. No. Kosnick. 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 I. Kosnick. I. Lee. Lee. No. Lee. No. McDonald. McDonald. I. McDonald. I. Nash. Nash. I. Nash. I. Pryor. Prior, nay. Prior, no. Swazinski. Swazinski, aye. Swazinski, aye. Tice. Tice. Yes, aye. Tice, aye. Thompson. Thompson, no. Thompson, no. Vang. Vang, no. Vang, no. West. West, aye. West, aye. Zhang J. Zhang J, no. Zhang J, no. The clerk will close the roll.
There being 63 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Karun Hagen moves to amend House file number 2128. The third engrossment is as, as amended. The amendment is coded A31-1. The member from Sibley, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Yeah, this is an actual health care reform, members, okay? And it addresses cost. Uh, the amendment inserts a language allowing for the sale of reference-based pricing private health insurance. This is the kind of private market innovation we need. It will allow consumers to purchase lower cost insurance while removing many restrictions on where they can go to receive care. We need innovation in the private market to reduce cost and not grow government. Members, what this will do, it will, it will eliminate pre-certification and networks. Patients can go to the licensed uh, medical provider of their choice. How do they do that? They do that by paying a certain percentage over Medicare, okay? Medicare pays on average about 87% of the cost of healthcare providers. What this plan will do, you can select a reimbursement rate by your private insurance plan. Remember, it's guaranteed issue. There's no underwriting. Uh, it's going to create more, greater competition. It's just an option to be available in the state. Uh, but what it'll do, when you pr provide, go to your doctor, your plan will reimburse at 120% up to 200% over and above Medicare. So members, even at the 20% reimbursement rate over Medicare, doctors and hospitals will actually at least break even. Now this will drop your premiums dramatically and your deductibles. Because members, one of the things we have to understand with uh, HMOs, pre-certification and networks, is the amount of cost over uh, bureaucracy has cost in the healthcare system which drives up your health insurance premiums. Let me give you this, the latest information. In 2020, the United States spent four, over $4 trillion on health care members. Over $4 trillion, okay? Guess how much of that was actually on health care instead of bureaucracy? According to published result, uh, published uh, articles, one third of healthcare spending is spent on bureaucracy members. Okay, that means out of that four trillion dollars, one trillion three hundred and thirty-three million plus was spent on bureaucracy, networks, uh, uh, pre-certification, and a whole host of regulations that limited choices for your patients and yourself. What this reform does, it eliminates that. It's one of the quickest ways to draw, drop the cost of health care, is by addressing the excessive uh, cost of bureaucracy, which we have created ourselves. Uh, the other thing to understand is, um, here's some of the difference between the current health insurance that's out there versus the reference-based pricing. Uh, number one, you would actually be the negotiator. You would have to find a provider who would, who would accept, let's say, 140% over Medicare reimbursement. And if your provider said he wouldn't accept that, you would have the option to go someplace else or to pay the difference of what he wanted. But you would be in charge. You would do for free what we're spending over a trillion dollars on on bureaucracy right now, driving up the cost of health care. Secondly, right now, it's like buying gas at a gas station where you don't know the price of what you're getting until after you fill up. Would you go to a gas station where the price wasn't listed and you filled your car up and you went inside and the, and the person told you, well, that's $4 or $5 a gallon? Well, wait a minute, you wouldn't do that. 
you want to know the price? Or would you buy groceries that didn't have a price listed on it? Members, what this does, this puts you in the position of understanding what your costs are. Okay? Now, you're still going to be covered for emergencies, but for your regular care, you know, you don't have to keep shopping. Once you find a doctor you can work with and trust, that's, you know, the negotiation is over with. So, members, this is a way to reinvigorate the private sector and bring transparency to, uh, to the health care system and also health insurance. Think of it, members. Right now, your health plans limit your choices of providers, okay? It limits your choices of what you can do through pre-certification. All of that would be gone. You say, Glenn, but does it really work? Well, Montana did implement it back in 2017 and 2018. Again, it's not a one-size-fits-all mandate you'd actually have to purchase it. What were the results of that uh, passing the reference-based price health plan in Montana? Just the initial results over two years, again, people have to purchase this so they have to become familiar with it, but they saved over $112 million on bureaucracy costs, members. Think about that. This could lead to a revolution in the private health insurance market, which we need to reinvigorate if you want to properly support your government programs. So members, even if you support government programs, you should support this amendment because it brings competition and an option to the healthcare industry. No mandate, no cost to government. It just brings an option that companies can issue in the marketplace. Um, the, uh, oh, this has been vetted. I belong to a health care reform committee. This has been vetted by experts from the health insurance industry and also the medical profession, well experienced ones. You know, we had testimony from medical providers that if a, uh, you know, Blue Cross or Medic or whatever can cut them out of a network with very short order. They could lose a third to half of their patients because of the network. This eliminates this, members. You, it'll provide you freedom and liberty in your health care choices rather than limiting and requiring referrals or pre-certification in the industry. So, members, if you want a solution to the high cost of health care, you'll vote for this amendment. If you want a solution for better access and price transparency, you should vote for this amendment. Please, members, give the private market a chance to reinvigorate with this amendment and uh, be able to uh, bail out the losses on the government programs. So, uh, Madam Speaker, did I ask for a roll call? You have not yet requested a roll call, Representative. Okay, I'll request a roll call. A roll call having been requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Grunhagen. Okay. Further. <laughs> <laughs> Representative David says I'm done. I have a day late. I over explained myself. Okay. All right. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Discussion to the amendment. The member from St. Louis, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Grunhagen, you know, we do agree on the goal of uh, reducing health care costs. But how we get there, that's where we need to negotiate and compromise. And, you know, this, this bill is, um, I'm not going to rise to a point of order, but we don't have Chapter 62K in the bill. So it's not, um, it's a new topic. But my concern with the language as, as written is that you don't, require network adequacy, you waive that. And so this is a relationship between a health plan and a provider. They decide which providers agree to this. It's not like you can go pick at any provider and ask them if they would agree to this. It's the health plan carrier. So I have some reservations about this. 
It needs to be vetted fully in committee, which wasn't done. I believe it was brought as an amendment, but we had no testifiers. So I just urge members to vote it down. Further discussion, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah, Representative Schultz, uh, we share the same goal. It's just your solution won't work, okay? This will. This does not limit your providers. There's no net, we have a law about network adequacy, and that's one of the reasons we need to pass this, okay? Because the whole licensed healthcare uh, industry is your network now. You're not limited in your choices. You don't have to get a referral. You can go to the doctor of your choice or the specialist of your choice, and they will see exactly how much they're gonna be reimbursed at, and if they're willing to accept that, or if you need to find somebody else or pay the difference. You will save this country with this plan $1.3 trillion if we could get it implemented on bureaucracy. Now you got Nameless, faceless bureaucrats deciding which doctors you can see, if you can see them, and pre-certifying you as far as your health care. It causes tremendous cost in the health care industry that doesn't serve the purposes of the patients. So members, please vote green, not as a Republican or a Democrat, but re vote green for your children and grandchildren and your relatives so they can have access to the health care they need. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the, the amendment. <laughs> members voting remotely, please vote. The clerk will call the names of all those members who have not yet voted. <clears throat> Bo. <clears throat> Bo. Aye. Bo, aye. Gomez. Gomez. <coughs> Gomez, no. Gomez, no. Hanson R. Hanson R, no. Hanson R, no. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Kosnick. Kosnick, I. Kosnick, I. Liebling. Liebling, no. Liebling, no. McDonald. McDonald, I. McDonald, I. Nash. Nash, aye. <coughs> Nash, aye. Swazinski. Swazinski, aye. Swazinski, aye. Tice. Tice, aye. Tice, aye. Thompson. Thompson, no. <coughs> Thompson, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 63 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Schumacher moves to amend <clears throat> House file number 2128, the third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A42-1. The member from Rock, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. The A42 amendment deletes uh, just a little bit of language out of the bill. Uh, there is a Supreme Court case moving forward right now that uh, will determine the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. And in the bill that we have in front of us, there is language that allows for the Department of Human Services, if the Affordable Care Act is determined to be unconstitutional that the Department of Human Services would be allowed to pursue federal funds and use state funds to maintain the current level of coverage for people throughout the state. Members, what this amendment does is delete the portions in there that commits untold amounts of state funds 
and would require the legislature to come back into session if we're not already in session to deal with this uh, problem uh, at the forefront of it. So, members, I would ask for your support on this amendment. Discussion to the amendment. The member from St. Louis, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I urge a no vote on this amendment. This would mean if we struck this language that potentially when the Supreme Court rules in July of this year, that 450,000 Minnesotans would be would have no insurance. They could not get access to health care. And it would also mean a loss of $2.5 billion in federal funding. So we need to take all actions necessary, and that includes using state money if the Supreme Court strikes down the Affordable Care Act. So members, please vote no on this amendment. Further discussion? Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I would request a roll call, Madam Speaker. A roll call having been requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and members, if there is no better reason to vote yes than uh, what you just heard, I don't know what there would be. We are committing in this bill to spend $2.5 billion that isn't accounted for in anywhere in our budget if the Supreme Court finds the Affordable Care Act to be unconstitutional. Now, we aren't saying that if the Affordable Care Act is declared unconstitutional that these people would, that are currently receiving care would lose that care. We're just saying that the state's not going to be on hold for that until this, we've had a chance to look at it as a legislature. If that's decided in July and we can't come back until next February to deal with this and there's a $2.5 billion check that's been written, before that, members, we're going to be in trouble. And the question has to be begged, where is that money going to come from? I suspect that we're going to have to pull that money from the Health Care Access Fund in order to make this work, $2.5 billion out of there. And how do we do that? We do that by having to raise taxes, primarily the provider tax, which is going to add more costs to our regular health care system. So members, if you want to raise the cost of health care in this state and commit untold billions of dollars to the state without having any supervision or accommodation ahead of time, please vote no. But for the rest of us, I would encourage you to please vote green. Further discussion? Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Schumacher. I really appreciate you bringing this amendment up. And members, I unless the members on the other side of the aisle know something we don't. It appears that there will be monthly special sessions all summer and fall, unless the governor is planning to give up his emergency powers. So that being said, I think we would be able to deal with this in July or August, or if there is this um, issue brought forward by the Supreme Court. So I urge members to support the Schumacher Amendment, because we will be able to deal with this. And if the governor does give up his emergency powers, and he could still call us back into session to deal with this if it's necessary. So rather than leaving a $2.5 billion hole potentially in the budget members, I, I think we should come back and take a, a more um, measured look at this if indeed it happens. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Those voting remotely, please vote. The clerk will call the names of all those members who have not yet voted. Hanson R. Hanson R. No. Hanson R. No. Houseman. Houseman. No. Houseman. No. List Lagarde. List Lagarde. No. List Lagarde. No. McDonald. McDonald. Aye. McDonald. Aye. Mecklen. 
Mecklen. Munson. Munson, aye. Munson, aye. Nash. Nash, aye. Nash, aye. Swazinski. Swazinski, aye. Swazinski, aye. Thompson. Mecklen, aye. Thompson. Thompson, no. Thompson, no. West. West, aye. West, aye. West, aye. Uh, do you want me to recognize Mecklen? What did he say? No. No. Mecklen. Mecklen, no. Mecklen, aye. Mecklen, aye. The clerk will close the roll. With 63 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <coughs> Damoth moves to amend <coughs> House Bill number 2128, the third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A47-1. The member from Stearns, Representative Damoth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm happy to share the A47 amendment with you. Almost every time we heard a bill this year creating a new requirement for private insurance, there would be language which would exempt the public programs from those same requirements. The state shouldn't create different roles for it to operate under, especially as you study competing directly with those private insurers by creating a government-run insurance program. Exempting the state's insurance plans from mandates on private insurance raises a lot of concerns for me. There are several critical benefits we require of private insurance. Madam Speaker, would Chair Liebling yield to a question? Representative Liebling, will you yield? Yes, Madam Speaker. She will yield. Representative Damoth. Thank you, Chair Liebling, and it has been an honor to work with you this year on the Health Finance Committee. Um, I do have a question for you. Chair Liebling, do you think that it is important for public health care programs to, to cover items such as cleft palate or Lyme disease? Representative Liebling. Madam Speaker, thank you, Representative Damon, for the question. You know, usually we hear complaints from uh, Republicans, frankly, that public programs actually provide better coverage than private. For example, um, we have um, in our public programs, we cover dental care. Now, it's not as good a coverage as we would like, and this bill does something to help fix that. And uh, people often don't get the care, and there are very, various reasons for that, but we at least cover it. It is a benefit under medical assistance. Whereas under private plans, you have to buy something separate. So um, the, uh, you know, I think um, they, they are very different. Private plans are very different from our public program. And uh, I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Representative Damoth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And would Chair Liebling continue to yield for a question? Chair yes. Lee she will continue to yield. Representative Damoth. Thank you, Chair Liebling. I wasn't quite sure. I appreciate the information that you shared, but could you tell me, um, do you believe that it is important for public health care programs to cover cleft palate and Lyme disease? Representative Liebling. Well, Madam Speaker um, and, and Representative Damoth, um, I, I think that it's really important that our public programs cover the kinds of things that people need to be healthy. I do, and um, we don't always succeed with that. But um, when you say Lyme disease, I mean, uh, I think public programs cover Lyme disease. Now, I know there's a, some controversy around what is Lyme disease, and some people believe there's the long-term Lyme disease, and whether that is the state of medical practice or not. I, I don't know if that's what you're getting at here, but I certainly think that our public programs should, and I believe they do cover the things that um, generally um, come up that are um, necessary for people's health. And if they don't, um, we are often trying to expand them. And we've done that in this bill. We're covering 
an asthma benefit that's new. We're expanding our postpartum coverage from, from six, um, 60 days to 12 months. We're covering periodontal um, disease under our um, dental benefit. So, um, and oh, and we're covering um, weight loss drugs, which has been excluded from our public program. So I certainly think it's important to have good coverage under both public programs and under private private programs. Representative Damoth. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Chair Liebling. Well, I do believe that it is important for the public health programs to cover cleft palate and Lyme disease. What is concerning, though, is in the language of the bill as it is drafted, it's unclear whether these coverage mandates would continue to apply for the public programs. Coverage for these are um, coverage for the, these are mandated in Chapter 62, which is in the bill, for private insurance, but not in Chapter 256B for public insurance. So this amendment, members, fixes the issue. Instead of exempting public insurance from each of the requirements that we apply to private insurance, we would require public insurance to meet whatever mandates that we impose on the private market. This change ensures fairness and ensures that we don't have any treatments covered today, but when this goes into a, but would not be covered when this goes into effect. And with that, Madam Speaker, I would request a roll call. A roll call being requested. There's 10 GOP members in the House in the moment. Thank you. And seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Further discussion to the amendment. The member from Olmsted, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I appreciate it. So members, this amendment, unfortunately, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What, first of all, um, what the bill does, there's a, a policy bill that was in, uh, part of the, an agency bill, and it does something that members who've been around a while have seen a number of times. It just straightens out the statutes. It doesn't make any substantive change. So. What Representative Damoth's amendment here is messing around with is just the, um, the straightening out of the statutes so that when we make a change, we are, we are intentional about where we're applying that change. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing I would say about this amendment is we just had a whole discussion about how we don't want to just uh, have automatic pilot on costs and just start spending a whole bunch of extra money for for medical assistance. I thought that was what Representative Schumacher was arguing. Well, what this amendment is doing is exactly that. It just adds a bunch of costs and um, they're not accounted for in the bill. It says here, um, any costs, uh, extra costs would be paid for in reduction to the operating adjustment. Any, you know, if we suddenly added a bunch of benefits to our benefit package, it would probably cost a whole lot more than than the operating adjustment for DHS. So, I mean, that just makes the bill not workable or the amendment not workable. But um, another thing Representative Dama said is that this is, um, these public programs are competing with the private. This is medical assistance. This is not competing with private insurance. These are people who have very low incomes. And finally, this is not, um, you, this is apples and oranges. The public programs, as you as you all know, or you should know, we don't pay the full cost of the public programs. Usually 50% of that right now, I think 56 plus percent is paid for by the federal government and it's under extremely tight rules. And oftentimes in our committee, we're talking about applying to the federal government for a waiver, waiting for something to be approved by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, this is not something we have complete control of. So this just really doesn't make any sense. Um, but again, just to reiterate, the underlying bill that Representative Damoth is finding so uncomfortable doesn't have any substantive, substantive impact. It just rearranges the statutes. And when we had the hearing in the committee on this, I asked that very question. And it was, the answer was very clear. No, this is not substantive. It is just straightening out the statutes so that when we make a change, we know what we're doing. Oh, and finally, I should point out to Representative Damoth and others, 
When we do require a new coverage mandate for private plans, under the Affordable Care Act, we have to pay for that. The state has to pay for it because the Affordable Care Act froze the benefit package at the certain point when that law went into effect. And in fact, two years ago, for the very first time, we did put in a new mandate and we had to pay for that coverage in order to do that. And by the way, that was carried by a Republican member that we put in our bill and we paid for it. So this just does not make any sense, members, and uh, please vote no. Further discussion? Representative Damoth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, well, members, I would encourage a green vote on this. We know that when we do impose mandates, there is a cost, and by exempting the public programs as a cost-saving method for the state is not the right way to serve those needing those medical services. So I would appreciate a green vote on this amendment. Further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Members voting remotely, please vote. The clerk will call the names of all those members who have not yet voted. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Hanson R. Hanson R, no. Hanson R, no. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. List Lagarde. List Lagarde, no. List Lagarde, no. McDonald. McDonald, I. McDonald, I. Nash. Nash, I. Nash, I. Scott. Scott. Swazinski. Swazinski, I. Swazinski, I. Thompson. <clears throat> Thompson. The clerk will close the roll. There being 62 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Baker moves to amend House Law number 2128. The third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A84. The member from Candy, Ohio, Representative Baker. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I, uh, I rise today to talk a little bit about a really an important issue that most of you know that are is really important to me. It's uh, SUD funding treatments. Uh, SUD stands for Substance Abuse Disorder, Use Disorder, excuse me. Um, and again, um, helping our providers that are saving lives all around Minnesota is super, super important. Um, we made some pretty good inroads on these conversations um, this year in Chair Fisher's committee that I was really, really proud to be a part of. One of the things that we've been, we've been working on is bringing in a lot of federal dollars to give an increase to our providers, which are desperately needed. And to the good news of this is there's dollars flowing in that direction, nice increases on what we call the base funding. But what's happening with the bill, members, is that the add-on services that providers have been using for a number of years, maybe five, six, seven years now, things like mental health services, medical services, um, women with children services, and also special population services. So those were add-ons that providers like New Way, uh, Vinland, Project Turnabout, all these providers around Minnesota, if they could add services that provided those kinds of assistance to people suffering from addiction, 
they could add on some extra cost and some reimbursements to that. What this bill does, members, is it, it gives them a bigger base rate, but, those, but those, a lot of those um, add-on services are now taken away. So it's kind of like going to an oil change, and they kind of give you a, a core price on a quick oil change, but they sort of get a little extra if you need an oil filter, or, I mean an air filter, or some, or some tail lights, or other things added on, but that's what made their core business work is because they tried to get some of those extras because honestly, your vehicle needed that. And in the case of our lives and our loved ones, they need those extra services because most people that enter a provider with a substance abuse issue, there is more than just addiction. So what this bill does is it kept a couple of the minor or the smaller add-on services, which again are important, the special populations and the women with children. But what they took away was the bigger ones that provided a lot of income for these providers. And, and if, if this bill passed today, members, our providers would see about a 10 to 12 percent reduction in their current revenue. For in-treatment patient services, outpatient, we have to do more than this. So members, I urge um, your help on this bill. I do want to request a roll call on this, Madam Chair. A roll call having been requested, seeing, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Baker. And again, um, this, this is a step in the right direction, but we're really, really close to making it much, much better than what it needs to be, because no matter what we do, we cannot let our providers go backwards on this. So members, I really urge a green vote on this. Uh, we are getting a lot of new money in this program because of the federal support that we're getting, and I would really encourage a green vote. Thank you. Discussion. The member from, uh, I'll just, Representative Fisher. <laughs> thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Baker, for the amendment, but I'm going to have to ask members to oppose it. I know we've done a lot of great work on the SUD reform package in our committee, and you and Representative Frank, you've been very involved with that. We've done many, many meetings. Uh, we've all agreed on the basic goals of increasing standards while also improving financial resources. Um, there's been a lot of progress made from where the governor had started out. You know, originally the governor's first proposal freed up a lot of state dollars that went to other programs. And what we've got in our current proposal is bringing those dollars that were freed up, those state dollars freed up, and bringing them back in. And some of the areas that we're putting these dollars in are in terms of paperwork reduction initiative. This is something that March was asking for. And that's also a bill that Representative Frankie, excuse me, Representative Frederick and Bliss had. You know, so these are some of the extra things that are also being done. We've got $1 million more being put in recovery community organizations. That was Representative Jordan's bill. Also something else that March was saying, uh, the providers were saying, we need these resources going into these different areas. We've got another $1.5 million that's going to go into culturally appropriate services. This is from Representative Thompson. These are additional dollars that have been freed up that are going and being reinvested right back into these programs. And this will help en enhance the uh, the enhancement rate will raise the enhancement rates that are being paid to providers that are providing these additional services. Most importantly, we are putting most of the state dollars that were freed up right back into the programs themselves. We increased the base rate substantially. And the big reason we were increasing the base rate because in the 1115 uh, pro demonstration project, it requires us to provide some basic services. And some of those basic services are providing for what two of our enhancement rates provided. So if the enhancement rates that we had before were providing for services that have to be part of the base, we move those requirements down below. And that's why we're eliminating two of the enhancements, but we still have two of the enhancement rates out there. Uh, some of the things that we also need to keep in mind is by doubling the enhancement rate, we are ensuring that providers are currently receiving these repealed add-on rates while being reversed at higher levels. That is helpful. For providers that are already enrolled, but getting the double paid for these services, our increase is high enough to make sure that they're held whole so that they're not going to lose ground. But reform is always tricky. And we've done our best to make sure that we don't pick winners and losers. We've listened to our providers and we've produced a balanced proposal to come out. 
But the other body also has a reform package as well. And so I look forward to this conversation continuing, as I think there will be more opportunities out there. We've heard in committee that March is saying we need a little bit more. Uh, however, we've done a lot to increase the base rates out there. But we're open to the conversation continuing. And so I'm going to ask for a no vote at this point in time. The member from Washington, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. I rise in support of the Baker Amendment. Members, Madam Speaker, you know, one of the issues we're seeing around this SUD reform um, situation, it all started going back to the governor's proposal and trying to get everybody to conform to the 1115 project. Um, and, and one of my concerns I've voiced from the beginning is, you know, and I want to thank Chair Fisher. He's been very open. Representative Baker and everybody on the committee and everybody involved, um, we've been able to keep some and not others. But, you know, when it comes to picking winners and losers, as Chair Fisher uh, alluded to, my fear is that if we don't leave these in place, we're forcing our providers to pick winners and losers. Because when you cannot balance the bottom line and keep your availability to services to our addicts and people with mental health issues, then you cannot run a business. And that's ultimately what this falls down to. So when somebody comes to you and they have too many co-occurring issues and you are already not getting reimbursed properly for those issues, you're going to turn them away. So what are we going to do, members? We need to fight for these. I ask for a green vote on this. A member for Representative Baker. Once again, thank you, Chair Fisher. Further discussion to the amendment. The member from Candy, Ohio, Representative Baker. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Chair Fisher, too. Uh, it has been great working with you on this. And, and you did mention this. The governor's proposal was junk. And we made it much better. But uh, if, if Chair Fisher would yield for a question. He will yield, Representative Baker. Um, the bottom line kind of comes down to, and again, I've got a letter that from March here that has a lot of concerns about the bill. They say the Senate bill is obviously much better, and I know we work things out in conference, and that's what makes a lot of our bills get better. But, but Chair Fisher, again, um, you, you said there's some add-ons and there's some more money coming in. We've got $350 million some budget in this, in this area of, the, of, 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 of HHS. And we've got some nice increases coming with um, the base rates. And we're still adding on more services. If you haven't heard, we have a tremendous work shortage in that industry. We, we, can't, we can't get enough drug counselors, administrators, nurses. It is a real dire situation. But the, the problem that I'm having is, is when I get letters from my provider, and this is to your question, I guess, finally getting to it, how do I respond to them saying, Dave, if the House bill passes today, our rates are going to go down 12%. You say there's other stuff out there, but it's squishy. We can't put a, we can't, we can't put a formula to that. So help me, Rep, Rep, Rep Fisher. How do I explain this to them if you say there's enough there? I can't put it on paper to show them that. I'm trying to find some of that background because we can't, we can't back it up right now. And I'm concerned that if, if these providers around Minnesota had a 1% reduction, that's going to take a lot of them out. So. Please answer that question. How do I respond to folks that are telling me it's going to be a 10 to 12 percent reduction with this reform that you have said is scary? This is scary to them, but it's real. So I would like to have that question if I could, Madam Speaker. The member from Ramsey, Representative Fisher. Thank you, Madam Speaker, Representative Baker. As I've looked at the bill and I've, I've taken a look at the calculations out there, my understanding is that with the two enhancement rates that are dropped, we are increasing the base rate, and the base rate is being increased enough to cover those two, uh, those two enhancements that are dropping off. Now, this base rate is going to go up for everybody, even those who are not originally providing those enhancements. So in some situations, we're going to have providers getting more than they were before because they were not getting these enhanced rates. And the way it was set up is that so nobody would fall behind. I do know that I did receive one email from one provider is that they're figuring that they might see a slight increase in what they were getting. Part of it was coming down to the population that they were serving. And so as a result, there are some instances where it is going up. We took great pains trying to make sure that nobody was going to fall behind on this. And this is one of the things that when I said the work is going to continue, if we're seeing that is, that is a problem, 
problem out there. We've got conference committee to work on that. And my suggestion would be is that we be looking at the base rate and not the enhancements, because these are provisions that are being asked for that, that are required as part of the demonstration project. Representative Baker. And thank you, uh, Chair Fisher, for that. Um, but you're right, you did hear from somebody who might see a slight increase, <laughs> and that's scary, slight. And, it, and as you said, and it's probably because they're in a community of color or a community that needs some, they're getting a lot of extra services for that. A lot of places like I work with out in rural Minnesota, they do a lot of enhancements with the medical uh, services and the mental health. Um, they, if they lose that component, that's a huge part of their revenue. So just members, I know where the majority wants you to vote, but understand that when we're done here today, you reach out to your providers that are providing addiction services and ask them what they think of this house version. They will not tell you it's very good. The Senate version will be better, as I'm told, and we can do better, and I just wish we would have had a better house position because we're about helping people and I think we could have done that today. So members, just one final lap. I'll just, just ask you for that green vote for folks that are trying to get their lives turned around. They need these extra services and our providers with workforce shortages, with, with expenses and getting it harder and harder for people to come to work for them. We need every, everything we can put in the toolbox to help people. This is a bill that I strongly urge a, a green vote on, Madam Chair. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. <laughs> Members voting remotely, please vote. The clerk will call the names of all those members who have not yet voted. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Hanson R. Hanson R, no. Hanson R, no. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Lislegard. Lislegard, no. Lissagard, no. Mason. Mason, no. Mason, no. McDonald. McDonald, yes. McDonald, aye. Miller. Miller, aye. Miller, aye. Nash. Nash, aye. Nash, aye. Nelson, N. Nelson, N, aye. Nelson, N, aye. Scott. Scott, aye. Scott, aye. Swazinski. Swazinski, aye. Swazinski, aye. Thompson. Thompson, no. Thompson, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 63 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. <laughs> 